<laughs> Later! <laughs> when we stand on the rooftop of Blue Parsons Creole, we can see the navy swarm the night sky, the orange glow of better towns to be from, can hear the highways to them hissing with car traffic and train horns cooling from their age-rusted tracks. We know the direction. <coughs> you just don't see us walking. The salt smell of the bayside is the church of our childhood, and we will not play the role of heretic just because America says, in a schoolman way, if you stay where you come from, you're doomed to repeat yourself. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> stay! <laughs> Where you come from, you're known <laughs> to repeat yourself. Oh, <laughs> stay! <laughs> Where you come from, you're down. This is the old part of the story. There's a legend. The shit bears in telling. Some say it's 500 years old, others less than 100. <laughs> <laughs> it centers on this. A woman is left by a man. Is it Malinche Cortez's translator and concubine? Is it a peasant who fell in love over lies? Either way, there are children, most say two, and most say this. The woman is deceived, destroyed, heartbroken. The man desires a companionship and matrimony of one closer to the station, one of his own race, nationality. Once content to confine his time with the mother of his children, the lowly status of her lineage grows troublesome to him. And their current proximity to poverty, while once poetic, romantic, intoxicating in its reality, becomes laborious, repulsive, complicated, and terrifying. <laughs> Could it be catching the squalor? If you mix yourself in that cocktail of ill repute, can you come clean of its contents and rise to your rightful spot in society? First, there is love. Let's say the couple occupies themselves in the sunshine of the world, clipping flowers, and they draw by hanging upside down in the front of open windows the perfume of their drying, soporific and warm. There is no music, but alas, they are dancing. Draped in quilts of lavender dyed cotton, the man and woman read fairy tales to their children, cautionary things, and expound on positive results of behaving with virtue. Dust flavored stories where witches drown and spoiled. Prison punished. <laughs> but it's terrifying to turn your back on your training. And in these moments, the man is bungled by eternal whispers. And these whispers revoke his current joys and the manifest self-doubt. The man's protocol preached to him since birth is this. Find a woman with a strong history of pleasing form and well posture behaviors. Woo her, win her, <laughs> and have her bear your children. Endow these children with your knowledge. Bless them with your name. Give them with inheritances and pray that your line endures strong for eternity. To the woman chosen... This notion is lost. To her, you seek love. She can't conceive the trepidation mounting in her husband's heart every time her family appears dressed in tattered clothing, playing music on boss instruments with broken strings, drinking until they forget their own language. She's prideful in the strength of her own charms. She believes the warmth of her affections are celestial stent, predetermined by heavens. In her mind and soul, the matrimony she's engaged in is somehow woven into the fabric of the galaxy, and her husband's eyes see beyond her flaws because love allows for every kind of forgiveness. But this is far from true. <clears throat> when alone, wandering amongst his own kind, in the town he never invites his family to for fear of humiliation, he encounters a myriad women who embody the stock he knew he was supposed to search for. Often, 
He curses himself for chancing upon his bride in a world foreign to him, alive with mystery. It is this mystery he accuses, blaming the unfamiliar surroundings as the catalyst for his faulty feelings. The mother of his children is still pleasing to look at, to haul. But now that the magic of her strangeness has tapered, been undone, been made homespun, a nausea at the eternity he's promised her has mounted, made him miserable. It is not so much a plan he hatches as a notion. He leaves himself open to the suggestion that he might still find his wife. After all, their wedding did not occur in his church under his Lord's eyes, but rather near a river at dusk, the faint wisps of orange sunlight leaking like streaks from the horizon. If I approached, he tells himself, I will not thwart the advance. In this way, he deceives himself into believing that any engagement that might grow out of his openness would be fatalistic, sent by God, and who would he be to intervene? Maybe he is sharpening a sword, maybe he is cleaning a rifle, maybe he is checking the mailbox, it all depends on when the story occurred. <laughs> there is nothing definite beyond this. The man finds a more suitable lover. On the lark, he meets a woman with money from a respectable family, and because they are more suited to each other, they fall madly in love. The man sets his designs on stepping away from his former family and into this new lady's life. He barely explains this to the old wife, says merely, I'll not be home again, and the wife is hard from here the legend becomes murkier. The shit splits in two. Some say the wife does it immediately. Some say years transpire before it's done. This is a possibility. The man's new woman cannot bear him children. They try. Over and over they try. But the results are always the same. Nothing happens. The man knows for his life's plan to be fulfilled, what mu he must have children to pass his name to. The new wife knows this as well, lays in blankets weeping and watching the sunset. She lights candles, she talks to Jesus. It's a great internal debate that twists in the man's soul. On the one hand, he already has two children. On the other, they must stay <coughs> secret or it could be his undoing. The new wife's depression does not abate. She stays hunkered down in misery, breaking from her walls only long enough to endeavor to conceive again. Each time becomes more mechanical, more wretched. This weird sex where no one opens her eyes. And afterwards, she sits in odd positions that she's discovered in books because unique, these unique postures are supposed to aid with conception, but they do not. Long is the season of their sadness, and the man schemes a long shot. He goes to the new wife in her nest of sorrow. Do you love me, he asks. More than anything, she tells him. Will you always, he says, no matter what. She becomes curious. You know, I will, she says. I don't understand. Promise me, the man says, no matter what. I promise, she says, no matter what. She says, I always will. Then comes the confession along with the scheme. I can go for them, the man says. They will be our children, he tells her. Yours and mine. Joy glows in the new wife's eyes. What are you waiting for, she asks. And the man goes. Again, the legend leaves us to a sum. We know nothing of the specifics beyond this. The man travels to his neglected abode. Perhaps on seeing his return, the old wife goes wild with hope. As he returns, she wonders, will he stay forever? Imagine then the pendulum of her emotion when he professes his purpose. Of only comfort the children. She breaks in the egg of waters. Miraculously, she escapes the ex-husband. She grabs up the children. Please with one on each arm. The man gives chase. 
Through brass, thorny trees, barbed grasses, and crags, he pursues her to the river bank where the two were united in marriage there. In that horrible hour, darkness of night upon them like a curse. The moon casting shadows with his pale yellow light. The woman decides that if she cannot have her children, no one can. She looks at them one last time at their eyes. Confused, their cheeks tied with fear, mouths open, panic breathing, children perceive everything. How can it turn to this? Once, a part of time, cradling some to now They say the drowning does not hurt. <laughs> but you wouldn't know it by the scene. The woman clenches a handful of hair from each child, a fist of hair. She buries her face in the river. Wild must be the thoughts. Face down in the water, screaming for mommy. But mommy's there. Mommy is holding you. Mommy is holding you down. Breathe. Eventually, your body makes you breathe. There is no option. It thinks it's doing the right thing. Pulling the brackish water deep in the lines. The flavor of Ritter her bottom just flooding the fucking senses. Sometimes bad choices keep lasting forever. Quickly, back in Scrape, Texas, Tim Biddle sits in the drunk cabin of his poor truck his face to glow with his cell phone's light. He nods at it. He unzips his pants. He takes his dick firm in his grip. The erect blink of its swelling. The faint smell of sweat and sweet. He presses a button on his phone. And a bright light flashes. Taking a pale picture. <laughs> <laughs> this what you like, he types. Then he hits sand. He waits. He waits for a reply. And for a long time he waits. <laughs> <laughs> but nothing. He shrugs. He shakes his head and he keys the ignition. The starter hacks electric and the engine turns it. Tim Biddles puts his dick away. <laughs> Tim Biddles drives into the night. <laughs> <laughs>